Good morning. I'm going to call the Marion Township Board of Supervisors workshop meeting to order. The time is now 9.05 a.m. on February 20th, 2021. We are holding these meetings through Zoom because of COVID-19 and Governor Wolf's emergency declaration stay-at-home order. Uh, we normally do the Pledge of Allegiance as one of the first actions on a meeting. However, due to the the nature of the telepresence meetings, we're going to admit it for the time being as it gets kind of complicated. Um, at this time, I'll open up the floor to public comments. Uh, Sue, did we have any public comments from email or phone throughout the week? There were none. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I know we have two residents on the on the call presently, Dan and uh, I saw Kelly just joined. Dan, do you have any public comments? I do not, Peter. Thank you, Dan. And uh, if I'll actually give Kelly a second to, uh, if she has her video on. Kelly, do you have any public comments? Um, let me uh, let me unmute you, just in case. No, you actually are unmuted. Okay, cool. Um, do you have any public comments, Kelly? No. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, first item for discussion on the agenda is uh, we had an executive session immediately following the, the other meeting, the regularly scheduled Board of Supervisors meeting last month. This was to review some possible legal concerns around property maintenance. It lasted from 8.13 p.m. to 8.39 p.m. There's also an emergency declaration that was made back in March by the Board of Supervisors, which uh, provided a provision to extend to a period of time lasting until action by the board. This was in response to the COVID emergency. Uh, we approved uh, it on April 1st and uh, November 24th, Governor Wolf actually extended the state level COVID-19 emergency order another 90 days. Um, as has been the recommendation in prior months, I suggest that we continue to keep this in place until that we feel the, the threat to public health and safety has cleared. Okay. Uh, we also have declared a disaster emergency for the winter storm that happened from January 31st to February 2nd. Uh, we will need a motion to make that official. We did it uh, as an emergency action in between e meetings, but we need to ratify it now. So I'll make a motion to approve the declaration of a winter storm emergency from January 31st to February 2nd, 2021. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Byreen. Aye. Jim. Aye. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is the resignation of the elected auditor, Bob Nelson. Uh, he tendered his resignation at the January 5th meeting. Uh, we have yet to formally accept it because once we formally accept it, we have 45 days, actually technically speaking, we have 45 days to accept the resignation and we have not accepted it yet because we would have 30 days once we make that, ex that motion to accept it to appoint the replacement. Um, we will need a motion to accept his resignation with regret, of course, uh, so I'll make a motion around that to accept Bob Nelson's resignation as an elected auditor with second. regret. Yeah. Is there a second? Second. Irene. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. I have a question about what he wrote on the paper. I mean, I, I was looking at the handwriting note um, and then it just doesn't make sense to me what what he wrote. What was that little blurb before the uh, he, wasn't voted on the year prior? Yeah, he wanted us to return the auditing, the actual auditing like we had with RKL or we've now gone with Aikens to the elected auditors. And that was something that was brought up and summarily not decided upon at a prior meeting and that was a, a, a revisit of that, that point. Just like an odd way that he commented it on the paper. That's all. Yeah. Maybe no, that's 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 what it that's the heart and soul of what it was because he had a, a verbal conversation with me as well because I was there setting up the the, the laptop and everything. Mm -hmm. um, that's really what it boils down to is they wanted to to get a look at the books as the the official auditors and I said like you know you can you can ask to see the books at any time. We're a very transparent, we're especially transparent board. So the worst thing that we might do is ask you to fill out a right to know request, which is a simple one sheet of paper, and we'll be happy to supply copies of things or let you look at things. Whatever needs to be done, you let us know. Um, so I have yet to see a right to know request around that, but the, 
the offer obviously is always there. If there's there's no there's no secrets kept in the in this administration. If you need to know something, just ask or try. We'll try our best to tell you and keep you appraised of it. Um, I guess I wonder what he's concerned about, but I, I think I think originally it was the 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 costs the Act five thirty seven legal costs for wow. going against like Cage. Yeah. How much was actually being spent? And I was like, you can you can still find that out. That's not like anything's getting changed once once a number is committed into the ledger. It's committed into the ledger. Um, but I think there's less of a concern now because I'd I'd hope that Bob realizes that even if we don't 100 percent agree with what Bob is is thinking on a, a course of action for the Act 537, he knows that we have the the people's best interests in mind that we're not going to do something that puts anybody at a disadvantage. So we'll see if anything develops from it, but that's, that's what that comment on the, the page was about. Okay. Next item on the agenda. We actually do have somebody who is willing and interested to serve as the elected auditor. Uh, we actually had two people, but one of them is, is on the road crew. And unfortunately by the nature of how second class township code is written, you cannot hold uh that position and another position elected or appointed within the township. So uh, Don Height actually showed an interest, but Don is on the road crew and uh, he had more of an interest in staying on the road crew than he did on being the elected auditor. So Sherry Sadison has kindly stepped up and has offered to serve as the elected auditor to fulfill the remainder of Bob Nelson's term, which expires on January, 2024. Uh, we would need a motion to appoint her so I'll make a motion to appoint Sherry Sadison as the elected auditor, replacing Bob Nelson. Second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay. Next on the agenda is the culvert on Marion Drive by where Jacob Weiss lives. Uh, the dirt, gravel, and low volume road grant application has been submitted. It was signed by Peter Wallace. So I'll have to maybe shoot him a text message and give him a special thanks for, for helping out with that. I'm sure you already did similar, Sue, but um, it was very kind of him to sign since he's the, the only one of us that still has that certification. And they've not been doing the courses uh, either at all or with any sort of routine frequency because of COVID. Assess and aside for that, I should be able to sign up for the April class. Good, 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 yeah. good. Yeah. Are uh, you guys able to uh, sign up for it? Uh, I'll revisit that with them because I had thrown that out there that if anybody is interested or able, I would love to have as many people as possible have that. I, yeah. I that. think Butch would like to do it. And Fantastic. Yeah, but I you, think Butch doesn't have a computer or know about computers so yeah would set need to at the office. With somebody. yeah i was gonna say i can set something up for him at the office that's that's no problem well, i told him too he could use the laptop and you know yeah. just sit in the yeah. meeting room um, yeah yeah that would be that probably be the best way to do it, is i can get that yeah. set up very easily yeah um i'll have to look and see what the dates are i do have some some work engagements that are they're gonna prevent me from doing anything really at all during the day or the evening a couple of days in the month um, I may actually not even be able to make the uh, April Board of Supervisors meeting. I'm not sure yet what my schedule is going to look like, but I may not. I may not be able to be online that that Thursday night. So I'll keep you guys informed on that. But if I can go to the April session virtually or or in person, I will. I will do likewise because I think just to echo that point, it is critical that we have as many people with that as possible, so that we don't have a situation where there's nobody that has it because that's yep. that's a yep. huge that's source of. I've got it right in front of me. We have Good. March 23rd and 24th, April 6th and 7th, and May 4th and 5th. I might actually I can attend any. I can attend any of those. So. Okay. I'm yeah. making Irene, Irene, say the dates again. March 23rd and 24th, mm -hmm. May 4th and 5th, and April 6th and 7th. I don't know why they have April and May flip flopped on their website. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And it's nice because it is a Zoom and you're at home and, you know, that's a... Right. Yeah. You're good. I um, looked at this yesterday and I said, because my boss is actually granting me some of my days off that I need. So I'm excited. I, I want to get it done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I probably can do... I might be actually be able to do the, the first week of April there. So, okay. So I'll, I'll check my, my schedule. I'll put in for time 
at work and I'll, I'll shoot you an email and let you know, cause I'm, we're going to have to register for that. Right. right. So. Okay. You can register me for any one of them Sue. Okay. We can, have, we, can have, we can have everybody on the April one. We can, we can right. do it as a group. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> uh, Okay, uh, next up, also in the, the avenue of road work, is the culvert at Sheridan Drive. Uh, this is by Gerald Hoover's farm at 540 Sheridan Road. The hole is still getting bigger slowly. We made a motion back in December to reduce traffic in the problem area of Sheridan Road from one uh, down to one lane per the McCarthy Engineering suggestion. And uh, we made a motion at the January workshop meeting to have McCarthy Engineering design a replacement for this culvert uh, using our road crew as the labor. Uh, we did receive a letter from McCarthy Engineering about really what that would entail. And I'm going to put that on the main screen. Yep, I'm, I'm actually getting it to the point where I can share the screen because I actually oh. I have a number of items for show and tell today. Um, <laughs> sure. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yeah, love it. Okay. So. Uh, no, that's the wrong one. That's the wrong one? Yeah, that is the, that's the one in Marion Drive. Oh, Peter okay. Stein. Okay, I'm sorry. It's the next one. It's the next letter. So they didn't send there us a drawing. There, okay. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so we one. have ba three basic options. We can put in two 48-inch two concrete pipes, two 60-inch concrete pipes, or a 12 by four box culvert. Um, my limited experience with this lines up with Jim's suggestion. The box culvert is gonna be the best mix of use and money. The problem is that it's the most expensive of the, the raw materials. The pipes are cheaper than the box culvert, but the box culvert is easier to install and generally is easier to maintain because you're you have one opening one larger opening rather than the two as far as longevity goes again i have no experience other than driving by and looking at something and pointing mm. um what would last the longest i mean what what's his opinion what's your experience my again limited experience take this with a grain of salt um i can confirm with with jim but it's the box culvert and again by the simple fact of you have less surface area getting you have less chance of stuff getting wedged in it like if you have the two pipes i'm sure you guys have seen places canal roads a prime example you have a pipe stick comes by gets wedged sideways and then everything else kind of piles up on top of it when you have a 12 foot by four foot opening there's not a lot of likelihood for something getting wedged in there so you have less wear and tear on it it's simply just stuff moving through right and it handles more it uh, handles more volume yeah. yeah so I mean, okay. I, I'm all for doing the thing that's going to last the longest and be the most efficient, even if it might be costly, because down the road it's going to save us money, because we all know costs increase over time, so. Not to mention, if, let's, hypothetically, this is by no means firm numbers, but if we did the box culvert and that has a 30-year lifespan, whereas we have the two pipes and it only has a 15, yep. unless it's twice as much money, that you're, you're actually better off spending a little more money up front than having to do it twice over the 30-year span. So um, I'll reach out to McCarthy and I'll ask him to do the full price on the, the 12 by four box culvert and see if we can't get that lined up so that when the spring rolls around the road crew can tackle that one. Okay, next up is the road project for 2021. Uh, we will need to add some spots into the, the bid packet around overlay. Um, it's been difficult between just work schedule, daylight and the fact that there's snow on the roads but uh, I was able to figure out a pretty good ballpark and I added some padding onto the numbers uh, based on looking at total road lengths and knowing where there were some problem areas in the past. So I have a, a pretty good ballpark that we can put into the bid packet now for what needs to be done. Uh, I came to a conclusion of Sheridan Road will need 33,840 square feet of uh skim patching, I guess is the, the right term for that. Um, let me actually stop sharing so we can go back to that. And uh, Wintersville Road will need 4,800 square foot of skim patching. 
Church Road will need 10,536 square foot of skim patching. And Stouchburg Road is going to need a resurface of about 0.7 miles. That's going to be potentially the more costly aspect of this. Uh, but we shouldn't have to do the like the oil and chip overlay on that one because it's that plus some more, essentially. Um, we're also going to need to include in the bid pack, and I have a note here for Jim to write that up, is anywhere that needs crack sealing prior to the oil and chip going down. I, we want them to seal the cracks prior to application. Uh, so I'll get that right up over to him, and we conceivably, if they're able to move on it quickly, we could get the, the item out onto pen bid before the end of the month. I have a question for you about roads in general. Sure. And I know this is something that we have mentioned before. Um, could we develop a system where we split up the township into quadrants or, or whatever kind of a, a, a schematic you think would be best? Yes. Where we could say these roads, these are, and, it, and it's just it's a circulating pattern. Um, and I'd like to to go over that with you so that I have a better understanding over the road issue. Absolutely. Um, so. I have a draft of one and oh, the 20, the 20, what was the 2020 and is now the 2021 roadwork packet is kind of the, the opening gambit of that. There's, these are the, the worst spots in the township. There's a couple of spots that we still need to do like culverts and things, mm -hmm. but these are the worst spots. So once we have that baseline, we then can divide it into fourths or fifths and then just systematically march across the township on a cycle. Every, every five years you go from one side to the other and everything has either been uh, resurfaced or crack sealed or line painted or whatever and we just systematically attack that every year it becomes less guesswork so once this is in like i said that's the foundational work that's the building block in which we can say okay everything is with some exceptions here or there really pa it's passable it's it's okay to get by and then we can start attacking things in an organized fashion rather than putting out fires as they as they crop up yeah, I guess, let me ask you, your experience having been on the board much longer, um, do you find that for the most part, things have been reactive instead of proactive? We're, we're shifting that direction. In the past years, it's, and even some of the time that I've been on the board, it, it's been reactive. Um, we've had like that one culvert where the roadway actually started to collapse and we had to close down the road and, and try to get funding for that. There's always going to be those things. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. And we haven't actually been able to based on like COVID and then the one year we just didn't get the packet out in time. Um, nobody bid on it. We're trying to get to that point of being in a, a nice cadence of doing it routinely. We're not, to put it lightly, we're not there yet. Um, but it's, it's been a gradual shift over the past three or four years from, oh man, something broke to how do we keep things from breaking? That's where I'd like to get and let me know whatever I could do to help you. Agreed. So um, I think plus, the first. Plus, also keep in mind that you always have school road. School road is awful. Yep. yep. And school road, school roads, kind of the elephant in the room. Um, yeah. There's, there's no good way to do that short of a full depth reclamation. And that is almost prohibitively expensive unless we can get grant money, substantial amount of grant money. That's, and, and this is old pricing. That was $400,000 a mile. Well, now Jim, Jim had said at that one meeting that um, there might be some cheaper there's options. A, there's a cheaper way to do it instead of doing that, um, like mixing cement in with this stuff. Kinda. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, that's I, like the like the ultimate best way to do a road. But mm -hmm. he said you can do it cheaper. Yeah, and I think if I'm recalling, it was cheaper, but it was it's obviously it's it's profoundly cheaper when you look at it at the big picture but when you look at it by like percentage it was not a huge percentage difference between that and the other one okay. um with that said though that's low on my priority list um like it's bad but there's a lot of other spots like uh the the, the culvert at sheridan road uh, the culvert that we have on marion drive that we're trying to get the grant funding for there's a lot of other things that are actually to the point of not being safe to drive on that we need to address more urgently. Well, now this culvert on Mary Drive that we're trying to get the funding for is yeah. not the one where the road is closed. Oh, I know. The lane is closed, okay? I know. Yeah. That's, that's a different culvert on Mary Drive. Oh, I know. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but that's, that's my point. We have stuff like that yeah. that is going to take priority over school roads, not the best. And... Irene, Jim. To Irene's question is, I mean, we do still have roads still, that 
are bad that need to be done. Yeah. And that's kind of what I said is like with some exceptions, we're, we're kind of at a baseline. There's some spots that are going to need specific attention, but to put it lightly, they're out of, out of our reach from a financing standpoint, short mm -hmm. of taking on a capital expenditure and like taking a loan out to do it. It's just, we don't have the bandwidth. And we usually, we rely on Jim McCarthy to help us find the grants. That's not something that we do on our own. I mean, we can, we can look, but that's one of the things that is within scope for them doing for us as an engineering firm. And I'm sure um, they're familiar with it because that's the stuff that they're doing all the time. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we, especially with the dirt and low volume gravel road that we, we work with them very closely on because they've had very good success in the past on getting us funding like a, a, a remarkable amount of success, I'd even say in the past on getting us funding through the dirt and low volume gravel road. Well, that's because we were the only ones that knew about it. Yes. <laughs> that, now that we're not the only ones anymore. <laughs> yeah, that, that certainly didn't hurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jim has an inroad there too, doesn't he? He's, he's on the board. He sits on some committee on yeah. or something. I, yeah. I'm yeah. not sure what, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, back to your original question, though. Yeah, I have a, a kind of a rough draft of a plan of trying to divide things into quadrants, but the past couple of years, and we've had a, a kind of a, a uh, kind of a stasis, if you will, on a couple of things the past couple of years for various reasons, yeah. is to get some of the, the oil and chipping done on the roads that we identified as being the ones that were in the most need of it, so that we can we can start from relatively even footing on turning over section by section. I think what I'll do in the office, we have the one uh, cork board up and that's pretty much become the treasurer's cork board. All the things that, that we're handling. I think what we'll do is we'll get up that other cork board and we'll commit that to road and other projects. So this way, you know, we have things there physically. We could take a look at it, pull them down when things are complete. So just like we had discussed. So I think we'll get that up within the next, well, whenever I could get down to the office. So are we supposed to get more snow? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think we're supposed yeah. to get a little bit. Yeah, like I think it was like maybe two inches over the next couple of days. Yeah. Slow accumulation, but. Yeah, we'll get down there and we'll get that up and this way we'll start posting those items and so that all of us can just take a look, become a little bit more familiar with it then. Okay, very good. And uh, I've been trying to pull any historic records that I have and Sue, if you happen to see any too, any of the old road work packets that we did like Hickory anything else that way i can send them over to jim and irene or put them up on the google drive that way they can see them okay okay next up is the costars road salt contract renewal the enrollment deadline is march 15th 2020 excuse me for just one moment i could put my bowl in the sink <laughs> Sorry about that. Forgot to lock the office door and I had a small child wander in. So, see, Irene stepped away for a moment. That's okay. We'll use this time to... What was that? Oh, you're listening. Okay, good. Okay, so the uh, the CoStar's road salt contract is up for renewal. The deadline for us to, to make the renewal is March the 15th, 2021 uh, for the upcoming 2021-2022 season. Uh, last year, we renewed for 100 tons. The way the contract works is we would be required to take a minimum of 60% of that or 60 tons and a maximum of 140% or 140 tons. Uh, I'm suggesting that we take uh, 100 ton again. That has been kind of the sweet spot. Well, no, wait, uh, no, wait. Go ahead. We initially last year contracted for 200 tons, but because we didn't have room to store it, and everybody was finding that problem. CoStars mm -hmm. actually let us change it, which they don't normally let you change it. Yeah. They let us change it, so you had motion to change it from 200 to 100. Okay, In the that's past what I'm few years, we've been getting 200. Okay. And we're at the point where we have, we don't have any more salt at Tulpahawken, technically well, we're speaking. We're getting those three loads delivered. Those have been ordered. Yeah. And we our 140 percent would give us one more load we are we have already gotten 100 tons yeah but we could potentially get one more load we don't have to take yeah. that one more load okay so 
reasonably speaking, exiting the winter season, we have the three that are arriving and we have another one that we could take. So that's four, four loads. Even if we have the same winter that we had this year, I think we'd probably be good with another 140 ton based on that. Because we're, we're basically exiting the winter season fully stocked unless we have another storm that we need to go but out and salt we, for. we pretty much, I mean, you might want to take a swing by and check out the salt shed because it is not full. Well, three three loads is a pretty decent amount of salt. No, no. no. I mean, they, we had three loads delivered over the course of the past week. Um, I thought, and I it, thought the salt shed even, only held... even half full. Okay, I thought the salt shed held four. Let me... um. We no, talked to Butch. I, I Maybe think a... we have. I think we have on the. Um, so when when I do the co-stars contract, you have to tell them how many tons your shed holds, and I think ours is listed as seventy-two. Wait, see if I can figure this out here. Yeah, because I'm, I'm looking. Here. I'm looking at the one in the packet, and I'm seeing if there's anything there. No, I don't think there is. Either way, I can talk to Butch. Um, we obviously don't want to undercut ourselves, but we also don't want to order so much that we have to potentially exactly. store at Tulpa Hawken again. Um, how many tons are in a load, by the way? Is it 20? Approximately 25. Okay, it's 25. I mean, they, they, they say a triaxle can hold 25. Generally, they don't fill it up, but actually the last three loads we've got at, gotten have been 25 tons. It's kind of amazing. They, they generally count on the load being 22, 23. Okay. I, I can't hear. Stockpile capacity, 72 tons. Okay. So that's... I, don't, I don't think that's accurate because, like I said, we got three loads and it was not even half full. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, because that, be, that would be more like what I was thinking, three or four loads is what would fill that that thing so if that's not right then yeah that's what i'm saying you might want to just you know just swing around you have to get out of the car just swing around there take yeah. a look at it and it's not real full but but then again you know if we run into the same problem where are we going to store it yeah that's just it you know and like i said last year they allowed us to change it they don't normally do that i don't and that was because of covid yeah plus because um Nobody, nobody needed salt because last year it didn't snow that much. Um, I don't know if they're going to let us change it this year. So it, I don't okay. know. It's always like a, you know. Okay. Let's let's pivot on conversation for for a moment. One of the other things that was sent out, and Sue, thank you for doing that. And I'm going to share my screen so that everybody can see it. Is we got an advertisement for uh, structures for salt sheds. We could potentially, if we're in, still interested in doing this, uh, relocating the salt sheds. These are not god awfully expensive. Uh, I believe the price they had at the bottom was. I remember seeing a price somewhere. Did I look that up? Maybe it was like ten thousand yeah, dollars. Like yeah, there it is. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. It's yeah. at the bottom. Ten thousand five hundred. So we could potentially get, and we don't necessarily need the one that's in the brochure here, but we could get additional salt sheds to be put behind where the existing salt sheds are. If we are still looking at potentially repurposing some of the areas in the building, like taking the area that are, is currently the garage and converting that into to more office and meeting space. Because then we could, if we're, if we're actually going to march forward on that, we could say to co-stars that we would like to take 200 tons. Because then 60% of 200 is... Like, yeah, let's say 120. Yeah, My math is right. Yeah. yeah. My brain's not working this morning for math, but um, that 120 would be a reasonable estimate of stuff. My only concern is if we, we locked in for a bare minimum of 120 and we already have 100 tons in the shed, there's going to be nowhere to put it. And we're going to run into the same thing that we ran into last year. And we're going to have to, to plead. I shouldn't say plead, but we're going to have to ask around and, and see if like Tulpa Hawken would be able to babysit our salt again. I'm all for looking at a structure. I'd be very interested. Well, then, then keep in mind, too, that when I ordered the three loads that Tulpa Hawken was storing for us, um, she was 
the person at the salt place was going by our, our current contract and she said, oh, you can't get that. You only have one more load allowed on your contract. Um, so she had to check with her supervisor and she said, we'll do it this time, but do not make a habit out of this. Um, yeah. you know, so so that gets a little dicey too yeah. there. I'm thankful Tulpa Hawken let us do it because it helped, helped us out of a bind, but it is certainly for every every party involved is not the the ideal way to do it. Right. So um, with that said, if we're, if we're all kind of in alignment that we should be shopping around for uh, salt structures like this, like we don't need one that's actually made out of wood for storing the salt. It's actually probably going to be better if it's made out of concrete and stuff because of the corrosive nature of the salt um, and uh, start shifting stuff out of that building over into those that we could get additional space for uh, some of the money that we either have in liquid fuels, I think we're technically allowed to use that for that. I'd have to check. Uh, or we did have stuff budgeted in for building mm -hmm. improvements that whether it's one uh, code of accounts or the other, there's a couple of different ways that we could attack doing this. And I'm sure this isn't the only place that sells these. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. We happen, to, we happen to get it in the mail. It's like, oh, well, they're from Lidditz here. Yeah, I'll we should de for everybody. definitely shop around. But this is a, a good kind of opening to that that uh, that line of thinking because mm -hmm. it's it would be a better use of the space like we have that area behind the current salt sheds that is just wide open mm -hmm. we could monopolize on that and then start using either that shed or look at trying to get like a pole barn later in the year to put the trucks from our garage over to the like air quotes around this but new garage and then we could start trying to repurpose that area of the building because it's a lot mm -hmm. of good space back there Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and Sue, keep me honest, it used to be classrooms before they converted it into a garage. Yeah, that was first grade. <laughs> um, that, that would, that would be an ideal space, uh, to, to set up like an office. Um, cause I know you, Sue, you had brought this up in the past. Our office is not really set up. It, it works, but it's not really set up in the way that you should have an office set up and yeah, like, that you was, look at that other... was just my my wish list you yeah know, it'd be nice if the files would be right there yeah um, i mean it's not a problem to get up and walk over to the file room but no. it would be nicer if the files would be right there yeah um, yeah no and I, I agree with you from one of the other concerns that you had was like from a safety standpoint you're and this is why other places aren't set up like this is you, you have if somebody came in you're you're kind of cornered i am yeah there i can't get out yeah so uh, i think my personal assessment on this is let's go for 200 tons and let's start getting quotes from various places around like the, the Jersey block, like tent structures, like it's in the brochure here. And we'll see if in the spring we can get our ducks in a row and move on starting to shift some of the, the use of the space and the township building and the surrounding stuff around. Now, Peter, if you could, uh, if you have an opportunity again, we'll have to wait until the snow clears. Yeah. If you could walk me through the lot and yeah. we can, um, uh, place markings and measurements in this way, I know I could certainly use my time to give make some phone calls okay. and uh, shop around. I like going to places and, and seeing and touching and smelling things. So, um, <laughs> yeah, in this way, you know, I could give you the best, uh, you know, my best um, impression. Uh, Jim, if you're available, uh, we could certainly do that together, and this way yeah. we can um, get give you some good feedback. But I, I need to know dimensions and, and location. And you just uh, said something about a pole barn, as well. Yeah. So long, long term, I'd like yeah. to I'd like to see us shift out of being in in the building for the trucks because mm -hmm. like they fit there, but we only fit the two trucks, and then the grader and stuff is kind of tetris in in that that other area. Yeah, it would be really nice to actually have a space. A, a good proper space for the trucks to park and for us to work on the trucks and do maintenance. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, like, again, having that long-term future plan so that we know physically where things are, I'd hate to put something down mm -hmm. and then it doesn't work to maneuver other items there. So let's, let's, let's have that short and long-term plan, get some physical dimensions and we could start pricing and uh, um, getting a better understanding of what our needs are and, and what's going to work well for the town. So, Completely I'm agreed. Forward. Completely yeah. agreed. Okay, so then we'll uh, we'll connect at some point over the next couple of days. Yeah. Uh, to, until the snow melts. <laughs> well, I mean, we can we can float some preliminary stuff. I have some okay. some stuff that I was drawing on top of from like Google Maps. Um, 
that I can send your way and we can brainstorm a couple of ideas and then get uh, get together to do some measurements and stick sticks in the oh. ground with some some string when That'd the snow great. melts. That'd be great. And CoStars posts other contractors they post a, a bunch of other people so i mean that'd be yeah, you, you can actually thing. go on the co-stars website and see who all their vendors yeah. are yeah, yeah 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 take advantage of that opportunity mm -hmm. so okay so then getting back to the road salt we need to make a motion before the deadline is march 15th so we need kind of you need that either today or thursday i'll, I'll make salt amount i'll make the motion for 200 tons for co-stars okay. for the 2021 2022 season okay I'll second that. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Do we have a price per ton? Um, this year it was 61, 64 a ton, and, and she told me it had not gone up um, in the last two years, I think she said. Um, so that's not real expensive actually yeah that's actually i think that was considerably less than when we had to buy it on the open market i want to yeah, say open market I, I was like you, 75 i can tell you real quickly when we we ran out of salt and i had to call around and um that was it was like two years ago i think yeah that was that was two years back can't find it now but I, it, it it's cheaper through co-stars definitely yeah it's um, it's not monumentally cheaper but it's it's enough like i said it was i think the difference of about 14 dollars per ton yeah I, I i can't find it now but we'll we'll look and we'll we'll reference that on thursday night dan or we'll send you an yeah. email and let you know yeah we could do that I mean, I know grit is, um, is, um, and it's good, is cheaper through Coast. Uh, Tennessee Supply participates with CoStars, and their grit is, um, uh, like, ten, uh, what did I tell you, Peter, like $10 or yeah. more cheaper than the other guys, so. Yeah. Yeah, the CoStars thing really does, mm -hmm. does mm -hmm. make a difference. Mm -hmm. All right, then I will, I will get that information by Thursday, and then I'll, I'll make the renewal too. Okay. Next item on the agenda is the street sweeping. Last year, we had the secretary contact industrial grounds maintenance, who normally does the street sweeping, to schedule for May 12th, uh, with the rain date of May 13th. Uh, the stones are normally dumped by the township building, and in the past, the fire company has provided the water. Uh, we would need to put up 60 no parking signs to ensure that the street is clear on Main Street so that the, the sweeper can actually get everything. Um, I personally, uh, um, I don't have any objection to doing this again on uh, like May the 12th or the 13th. That's a, a Wednesday or Thursday, kind of right in the middle of the month. Um, we would need to reach out to the fire company to see if they're still willing to provide the water. Um, and I do I have, know that la last year, Industrial Grounds actually called and canceled it because of the COVID thing um so i did not reach out to them yet to see what's happening this year but i just put it on the agenda that way you can motion it and yeah you know. no I'd, I'd much rather approve it and if they yeah. have to cancel they have to cancel but if exactly. they they don't then we have them do it as right. was the the old normal right um but all, in terms of the signs i have no problem going out and doing that with a staple gun which is what we've done in the past i did that the one year peter wallace did it uh, with me another year and then he did it mm -hmm. by himself years before that mm -hmm. um so any thoughts jim irene do you have a, a preference on dates or do, yeah. does may 12th and 13th work for you Seems like and, uh, and just for right? jim and irene um the street sweeping is done on main street and palatine place and i believe that's all um i mean they don't go through the, the whole patch if it's just um mm -hmm. you know, the, the main the main thoroughfare the main, yeah mm -hmm. That's fine with me. Okay. And I'll make a motion to schedule, tentatively schedule the street sweeping for May 12th and May 13th. Okay. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye.
Okay. Next up is the Berks County Cooperative Purchasing Council line painting. Uh, we have not gotten a price sheet yet, uh, but we will need to refer or return the form no later than April 1st with a mileage estimate. Last year we had submitted for 10 miles of line work. Um, I suggest that we contact A1 and ask for a price sheet before we I, make I any. I did, I emailed them, but I haven't gotten anything back. I know the last few years, um, we had a price sheet from 2018 and 2019 and 2020, they said were the same prices. So I'm assuming it's gonna be the same, but okay. I wanna hear that from them. I was gonna say, uh, I, I haven't I gotten an email back yet. Oh, that's fine, but um, we'll have to, to float some ideas of where we need to have lining. Um, and this again too, last year they canceled because of COVID. Yeah. So, so bare minimum, we have the stuff from last year that mm -hmm. we can do. I think we actually had, I had a full 10 miles last year, didn't I? It was like 9.8 or something like I, that. Yeah, I think so. I'd have to go back and look at that. Um, I don't have that with me, but yeah, yeah no, I think, I think that's fine. I remember it was pretty close measurement wise mm -hmm. that I figured out total. Um, so we may actually, if there's areas that you guys identify or if there's stuff that I see driving around, we might actually want to up that rather than lowering it. And this is one of the other things too that somebody had suggested before, the dividing the township into thirds or quadrants yep. and then just, you know, every year give them a different section. Yeah. Um, rather than having someone drive around and getting mileage. And, yeah. You know, so you're, you're absolutely spot on and the 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 way that I had kind of envisioned this is if we have let's say hypothetically four areas or five areas, the first one gets road work, the second one gets line painting, or like the third one, so that it's it's staggered so that they're mm -hmm. not you're not overlapping and you're not potentially putting new lines on something that you're going to be repaving the following year. Right. Um, but just finding that that sweet spot of getting that rolling cycle for things. Mm -hmm. um, and then we actually may find a point where if the lines are holding longer than the cycle, like for example, if we paint lines on year one and we come back to them on year five and they're still good, we might actually be able to fall into the regular routine of they just get repainted when the road work is done. We don't actually have to do supplementary line painting. Other than like, there might be some spots here and there, but that might be even something that the road crew. Uh, hi, Kelly. I see you waving. You should be unmuted. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to say about the line painting. Um, it, there was a time when half the township was done one year and then the other half of the township was done the other year. Okay. I understand what you're saying with the projects, but I don't think you're going to be able to go uh, numerous years without line painting. For the most part, the lines, and this is this is really a reflection of the road and not the line paint itself, but the lines should, under good circumstances, hold for more than a couple of years. Like you should still have clear visibility on the painting after two or three years minimum. The problem we run into is our road surfaces are so rough that it doesn't hold or wear the way that it's supposed to. So as, as we start to get better surfaces on the road, and that's kind of what I was alluding to before, is we won't have to do it anywhere near as much. As we start to fall into that pattern, we may get to like the fifth year and say, you know, the lines are still fine. We don't actually have to repaint them. And we can start easing off on that and just doing the line painting when we do things like oil and chip. But I see your point. And, and that, that may be something that we find we have to do for the first couple of years as we get the roads to that level of uh, repair to be able to, to support decent lines for more than two years at a time. We'll have to, to, to put it lightly and honestly, we'll have to kind of play that one by ear. We'll have to see like, okay, we painted lines last year and they look awful this year. We got to paint them again um, until we start to have, like I said, the better road surfaces where they'll routinely look good year after year. Okay. Okay, Jim, Irene, any questions on line painting? No, no, I'm getting excited. Okay. To... <laughs> if you see anywhere that you identify specifically, we'll, we'll kind of merge our lists together. And uh, I know it's usually, in my experience, the areas that are around curves, um, just from, you generally get more people driving over it because of the curve and you get a different wear pattern because of like water runoff. Um, they're the places that I've, I've seen be the worst routinely year over year. 
Uh, but if there are any other areas that you you identify as being like, wow, I, I didn't even know there were lines there or they're really hard to see, let me know and I'll, I'll add it into the packet. Likewise, Kelly or Dan, if you have anywhere that you see that is in, in dire need of it, I can't be everywhere all at once. So if, if you see it, let me know. Yep. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is we had to purchase two tires for the front end loader. They were in basically entirely shot. It was uh, just short of miraculous that they were holding air towards the end of the, the snowstorm this past time. Uh, so we had authorized the purchase of two tires, two rear tires at Kepley's Tire, which was the cheapest out of the three quotes that we got for it. Kepley's Tire was $320 per tire, which included mounting. Binkley and Hearst quoted at $335 per tire, but mounting was extra. Uh, they did not specify a price. And Zimmerman Farm Service quoted $345 per tire and then an additional $90 per hour to mount the tires, approximately two hours worth of labor. Uh, so the, the clear and, and obvious winner there was Kepley's. So we had them put the, the tires on. We just need to make a motion to ratify this purchase. So I will make a motion to approve the, the cost of the two front end loader tires at Kepley's Tires to the, the tune of $640 plus tax. Second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. 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 Aye. Jim. Aye. Aye. Okay. <laughs> I think somebody was unmuted and we got a little feedback. Oh. <laughs> feedback. Somebody may be unmuted still and getting a little feedback. Okay, next item on the agenda is the Conrad Weiser Youth Baseball. Uh, this is normally the time of year when we email them about uh, seeing if they're gonna use the ball field. My immediate concern is the park is still technically closed. Right. Do, we, do we want to revisit the idea of opening the park back up? I'm on the fence about that because there's still very much the same concerns that we had months ago around COVID and the whole safety thing having to wipe things down and everything else that it may not be prudent for us to to do that irene and jim what are your thoughts and i know last year also oh, they they didn't hold practices because of covid but mm -hmm. you know this is just the time of year i reach out to them so yeah so i i would almost go the route and jim irene please chime in that we should maybe send them a letter saying that we we look forward to having them use the ball field in the future, but in, in light of COVID-19, the playground and the, the ball field are gonna be closed for the foreseeable future. If there's any changes or anything like that, we'll, we'll let them know, uh, but we look forward to working with them or, or letting them use the, the equipment there, ideally in 2022. I agree 100%. We're still, there's still too many cases public gatherings are not encouraged because it's not just the kids that come out, it's the parents, it's other spectators. It's not something I want to encourage. And then, you know, Marion Township is pegged as the hot spot for a COVID. Uh, COVID yeah, outbreak. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to be a Petri dish. We've been, we've been careful and cautious yeah. up until now. It seems yeah. silly to, to throw yeah. caution to the wind for, for Little League. Yeah. Read. Okay. Uh, Sue, would you draft a, a short letter and send that over to uh, the Conrad Weiser Youth Baseball League? Yeah, uh, Ryan? Know. It's Ryan, right? Who yeah, I, don't know talk to? He's, I don't know if he's the president of it anymore, but I'll send it to, I'll email him and then find out who it is. Because um, okay. I think they change presidents every year or something like every other year or something like that. Okay. okay. Next up is the, uh, some of the financial stuff. Uh, Aiken's accounting, the audit, the annual audit has begun. Uh, seems like it's going well. I'll actually turn that over to Irene as this has been squarely in her wheelhouse lately. Yeah, no, it, everything is going very well and huge thanks to both Sue and Dan for being in the office when I couldn't be. Um, they have been wonderful, excellent communication, uh, really going into the records and being in way more detail than I recall working with a prior group and uh, uh, it's been some back and forth email communication and phone calls, but for the most part, I think they're satisfied with what we did. They helped us, they helped pinpoint some other problems which have been rectified and they're going to help us to keep a little bit better accounting. 
Um, one thing that I found that was different from, again, the prior auditor, auditor, they reached out to me, they said, no, if you have a question, you give us a call anytime throughout the year, we want to make sure that you're doing what we need you to do so that, you know, the following audit is, is smooth. So, and that, that was something I hadn't experienced with the prior auditor. Granted, it was a very lopsided, weird year for the audit where I would have thought that everything would have been done prior to uh, me taking over. Um, so, but a, a very different mood, very um, cooperative, which to me is striking and, and good. Um, so there was a couple of uh, bugs. They helped me uh, figure things out. And um, um, I, I'm more than pleased with what they've done for us. It's not just a, a review of our records. They're giving us pointers and, and asking us to do things a little bit differently, which is, again, going to put us in better financial shape. So again, like you had mentioned earlier uh, in the meeting, if anyone has any concern within the public over where funds are going to, that's a very easy and simple thing for me to, to find for anyone. And Aikens is going to just help us be better bookkeepers in that respect. I'm also hoping that, again, with Dan's help, that we're able to continue a good, healthy format and, and bring it forward so that the next set of supervisors continues to have this good um, operating procedures so that we continue to function financially healthy. I agree. And I'm very thankful to have Sue. That goes without saying. And Dan, I'm very, very appreciative yeah. of, of your involvement. You've been a huge help over the past couple of months on a great yeah. number of things. Um, and, I couldn't have done it without them. Yeah. And it's... It's a, a hallmark of, of everybody coming together and working really well as a team, too, that everybody is bringing their, their best, and it's the net product shows. I think we're finally getting to a point where we actually kind of line up with what's kind of considered the industry best practice from an accounting standpoint, whereas in previous years it had been, not to underscore anybody's work, but it had been kind of mom and pop by comparison. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, honestly, this is this is one of the best jobs I've ever had. And what makes it so satisfying is a group of people that I work with. I mean, you guys make it so, you guys make it fun. You guys make it um, friendly. And, and I, I always look forward to it. I mean, I, I can't say that everyone in this position has, has thought of that, but my, uh, at my other job, people always ask me like, how do you like it? I go, I love it. I love it. I really do. And I'm still enthusiastic and I, I still want to do more. Um, and uh, it, it's just been great. And you guys make it great. So good yeah. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that yeah the next uh, subject is the liquid fuels audit yes so take, take it away this. yeah and 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 that was something that was done quite some time ago i don't think steven stoppy had any concerns about it and again files are neat everything is simple it's a, just a matter of getting the information over there weren't any big concerns i think there was some issues with where funds when funds came in but other than that i can't recall anything unusual about that so yeah, that was the only thing that i saw in the letter that something got deposited later like a month later than it was supposed to but that that might not have even been us that might have been we just like the check was delayed in the mail so yeah and, and that's been that's been part of our problem with all the funds and part of those delays are covid um so you know again uh, thanks to uh akins we're settling stuff in the accounts and, and they're clarifying uh when and where we should put things against you, just as you said before, employee best practices. You know, we, we, it, this, we can't have a mom and pop shop. That's, that's out of the question. And anyone that thinks that way really doesn't belong doing what we're doing. Um, this is a government entity. It has to be treated as a government entity. I take it with 100% seriousness because my, my whole future is at risk because I'm a bonded individual. I, I take this as serious as anything else that I do in my professional life. So it's not my money, it's the taxpayer's money. And I have to be a thousand percent responsible for it because I know there's legal consequences if I choose not to be. So I worry about every penny. Good. A lot. And you Good. get all the text messages over it too. <laughs> <laughs> yep. yeah. uh, so kind of on that same vein, not, not an agenda item, but just a thought. Um, we had talked about this months back. I, I still think we should look into setting up either like ACH transfers or like certain things being able to be paid automatically out of the bank account that we know are going to be relatively stable and recurring charges for things. Comcast, uh, Aikens, like the accounting billing, uh, because that's just one less thing that we have to have physically moving. It just happens and there's no 
no backlog of thought. We just have to log it into the ledger and, and print out the, the thing for, for record keeping. Yep. Yep. Um, On that note, I have an appointment Tuesday with Fulton Bank. Okay, good. And um, we're going to straighten out some stuff that they keep on messing up that should have been straightened out as of November. And I'm going to talk to them about the different credit card options. And I'll talk to them about the ACH payments. And we'll see what benefits we can get from, from everything. So that's exactly what was on my agenda for Tuesday. I have an appointment. So good. Very good. You beat me to it then. Um, yeah, no, no, no. Hey, it's, it, it, like I said, it's all being proactive. It's, it's getting us to where we should be and kind of having this on, um, I don't want to say autopilot, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't have been as difficult as it was had people asked a question you know, had, had inquired, like Dan brought uh, to my attention yesterday an issue and it was like, oh my God, I didn't know. And sometimes there's issues that you don't know until or unless someone asks you that question. And I'm all for saying, hey, I didn't know, but I'm going to find out that answer and I'm going to do what we need to do. So, um, and, and that's, that's, that's part of the challenge and, and to me, part of the fun, you know, a little bit of a stress with it, but yeah. Next item on the agenda is the website. Uh, I'm probably the, the stumbling block here. I, I didn't have anything this like past week and a half that lined up with Lisa or anybody else's schedule. So I'm going to, once again, try for this upcoming week. And if I need to, I'll actually take some time off, assuming nothing breaks at work. And we'll go through, I'm actually thinking, they, they normally like to do a screen share with their, their platform. I'm actually gonna see if they'd be willing to either do it through Zoom do a screen share through Zoom because then we actually have the option of recording the meeting if we need to look back at anything or, or revisit. Um, and then really that's that's the last step is once we're trained on it, we can go live. Everything else is, is pretty much ready at this point from a, a CMS standpoint. And uh, we can start putting up live content out on the site. I'll have to switch over like the domain uh, A records and things like that. So things start going to the new site rather than the old site that we have with the, the county. Um, and Sue, I may, if, if you have any contact for who normally does the webmastering with the county, I may need to talk to them because I'll, I'll more than likely have to put a forward on, on that old page. And I, I had a call a few months ago, um, and I'm sure I have her name and phone number. Uh, she was questioning if if they should take it down because we haven't done anything. And I said, well, at that point, we were still in the process of, you know, yeah. making our new website. So yeah, let it up for now, but. Yeah, um, if, you can, if you can get me her name, I'll call her and talk to her because it should be a simple matter of if there's credentials that I don't have for signing in, they might be able to reset it for me. Or if it's a simple thing where I say, yeah, go ahead and take it down, but I need you to put a, a DNS forward on for, if anybody goes to this old page, it just automatically kicks them over to the, the new site. Yeah, I'll, I'll look through my telephone notes and I'm, I'm sure I have it. I know I wrote it down. I, I okay. can't think of it right now, but. Oh, that, that's fine. Not not yeah. urgent for this particular yeah. moment in time, but if you can get me that, I'll, I'll start that yeah. up. Cause that's once we get the training done, that's gonna be the next thing is once the new site comes up, making sure that anybody go, going to the old site gets automatically redirected to the new right. one. Right. And if Peter, just a quick question on that. Would mm -hmm. they be able to, would they be willing to do like a split session? So for example, like you and I have these kooky schedules with our work, but yeah. it seems like Steve, Dan and, and uh, Jim are usually more available during like the daylight hours. Yeah. Is that something that they'd be willing to do? I believe so. And if they're willing to play ball on the Zoom thing, this is actually something that, yeah. like I'm sure I'd have questions if I was there, but if you did the session with them and recorded it, I could probably watch it at a weird hour when I'm done with work. Um, like either really early in the morning or really late at night. And then we can kind of go from there. So I'll, I'll start the wheels in motion with Lisa. If you guys let me know what your availability is this upcoming week, even if it's a situation where I can't be there, as long as there's a recording of it, just as good in my mind. Um, and then we'll work well, I, on it. I'm, I'm available pretty much every evening. I mean, I don't, since COVID is here, I don't go anywhere uh, pretty much. Huh? Okay. So, you know, I'm available. Okay, good, 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 good. So yeah, let me know what your availability is. I'll, I'll renew the dialogue with, with Lisa for this upcoming week and we'll see what what coalesces. Yeah, I'm available most evenings this upcoming okay. week too. I'm retired, so I'm always available. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, Jim, what's your availability looking like? Do you have any f evenings free this upcoming week? 
Absolutely. Any, any of them is fine. I'm home. Okay. Very good. I'll, I'll make that happen then. Okay. Next on the agenda is the noise ordinance. Can I talk a little bit about that? Certainly. Okay. I don't know how much um, everyone else has taken a look at it in detail. I say raise your hands, but um, the biggest difference, I know Peter had this concern before about when it comes to defining noise, uh, addressing it by the decibel le uh, level. Um, and Andy was kind enough to send over a couple of other comparable noise ordinances from other townships. I'm gonna say Laureldale, Ephrata, uh, West Reading. They're all fairly, they're all pretty much the same with, with a little bit of variation. My questions are actually for Andy because they did, oh, one of the guys just came through. Um, <laughs> sorry, down the road. Um, my, my concern is uh, how they define noise. And that's a question I have for Andy because when you are too vague, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to apply the law. Um, the other thing that he sent over, which I thought was interesting was an article that talked about decibel um, measurements using a smartphone. And what was interesting was that it, uh, the article was an older article because it only listed up to an iPhone 5. And what are we up to now? iPhone 12 or something? Yeah. So, you know, again, my questions for him more so are, um, you, I know your concern, Peter, was does the police department have a, a decibel uh, meter reader? Um, is that even necessary with what smartphone technology is? And, and how much of this do we need to have in order to support a case for the court? Again, I, I, I honestly, after reviewing what he sent over, plus what I had put together, I'd incorporate both aspects, but I need to ask him that particular question um, because usually a noise disturbance is something that happens before the police arrive or before a code enforcement officer can arrive. I know another question that we had was who will enforce this? And, and again, the other um, ordinances that he put together allow code enforcement to, to deal with this. So, you know, if this is something that someone from town says, hey, you know, um, so-and-so has been playing their music really loud and this has been going on for an hour, that should be sufficient to warrant a warning Mm -hmm. um, if it's continuous, it, it'll be sufficient to warrant a citation. Um, and I know, Peter, your concern was with your, your ladies in the morning, the chickens. Um, and interestingly enough, all these other ordinances had a similar clause where it was 10 minutes continuing, mm -hmm. a half hour intermittent. Again, we could certainly change the language of that. And even if the ladies are a little bit loud in the morning, it, it's how it's, it's who finds the noise disturbing, who finds mm -hmm. the noise um Untolerable. So, there's, there's lots of definitions for that. Yeah, and for the record, it's not not just worried about me. I know there's plenty of other people yeah, yeah, yeah. that have chickens yeah. and goats and things yeah. like that. Since we are in an agricultural community, that I, I'd hate to see us do something or like even Al Ferrandino with the uh, the I think he has parakeets or something like that. Right, um, right. Where but at we, the same time, if, if it's continuous and and now it's going on for hours throughout the day and it can't be controlled, then then you are affecting your neighbor's quiet enjoyment of their property, which is inherent in every property owner's um, right to to no. live, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I don't disagree that, like, if yeah. nuisance, yeah. The, the nuisance is kind of a, it's a hard thing to define because everybody's right. frame of reference for what a nuisance is is different. So right. we just want to make sure that, and I agree with you, that you right. shouldn't have people yelling and screaming at, two in the morning or playing live right. music overnight or working working with a chainsaw at 1 a.m. Like, right. I completely agree with you on that. No no objections whatsoever. It's just as we tailor this, very similar to what we did with the property maintenance, we have to make sure that we don't uh, we don't put a hammer in our toolbox that we inadvertently right. use to bludgeon people. Right, right. So I want to make sure that there's good application. It's fair application. It'll stand the test of time and it will hold up in court. Th th those, are, those are my concerns. Um, and I think, honestly, once we have the website up, if people see that there's a noise ordinance, then they're going to say, hey, you know, um, they might think twice before they decide to engage in certain activities that may be disruptive to other neighbors. Because we do have some neighbors that engage in activities and their attitude is, I don't care. But now if they understand that there is a consequence, then they may think twice about doing those kinds of activities. Mm -hmm. So... 
Um, you know, I, I think for the most part, everywhere I've lived, people are, are for the most part kind and considerate, but then there's the handful that aren't and we want everyone to play nicely together. And sometimes we have to, to demonstrate that the rules are there and, and they're there for a reason. So, yeah. but yeah, I guess, I guess, you know, unless someone else has a question, I did look at things in detail and honestly, my questions are more so for Andy because of the application of it. And, I, and I'm very thankful to him for sending over all that information plus the article about the, the noise measurement, because it was interesting. So, you know, my, my curiosity is, is will court allow an officer or someone else to say, hey, I have this app on my phone, I use it, I measured the decibel reading at, et cetera, when I was standing in my living room and yet the person was in their house and they were creating this noise. You know, not that everyone's gonna be that savvy and, and be able to be that detailed about the usage of it, but that's something that I guess I, Andy needs to answer for me. So, and then I could certainly come up with, with a new draft that incorporates some of these other noise ordinance um, information and, and again, get Andy's feedback on it and see what we'd like to do. Okay. Yeah, I noticed the one, um, I don't know which, which area that was, uh, West Reading. West Reading actually has in like a list of exceptions that you can have for things like blasting and stuff like that. One of them is actually agriculture, which mm -hmm. was kind right. of a net right. difference between a lot of the other ones. A lot of the other ones mm -hmm. didn't list that, which mm -hmm. actually would probably put to rest a number of the concerns that I had because of people with like, uh, I'm sure you have it near, near you yeah. with that. There's the, the cow farm yeah. that yeah. they're loud, but that's to me, that's just the, the nature of living in an agricultural community. Right. You're going to have noises of things like chickens or cows or if you live near a place that has goats or horses or whatever, right. um, which is a far cry different from somebody, like I said, using a chainsaw at 1 a.m. or running through your development, screaming at the top of their lungs at 2 in the morning. Right. So I would uh, I want to sit down and I, I read them briefly, but I'd like to kind of do a red line on them mm -hmm. between now and Thursday. And I think your, your questions to Andy are, are great. I don't know if there's any legal precedent to be able to use the like an, a smartphone app as a decibel reader, or right, if right. it has to be a specialized piece of equipment, but if anybody's gonna know, right. it's gonna be Andy. Right, right. And, and it, again, it's like, it's interesting because now we have to incorporate technology. If you think about it, you know, what did people do? People would call the police and say, hey, I hear my, my neighbors, they're really loud. And again, what, what is a decibel measurement? If I'm sitting in my house and I could hear my neighbors outside, that decibel measurement has to be at 70 or, or greater because of, of what science tells us. Mm. So we know that it's at 70. If I now have a smartphone and I could, I could record it, then I have additional information, but is it any really different than me reporting that I could hear them while I'm sitting in my living room? Yeah. It is, but it isn't. And, but you know, it gives it a little bit more weight. I guess I, I, my, my, I shouldn't say concern. My curiosity is is how much more because now if we detail this in our in our ordinance, is that going to be the threshold that people have to meet? So if we incorporate some of the language from these ordinances along with our uh, our decibel measurement, if it's either or, um, or if it's it's all or none, those are the kinds of questions I have for Andy. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Jim, did you have anything around the noise ordinance that you wanted to? To weigh in on or contribute? I think I agree. Let's talk to Andy about some of the issues. And, and I also agree with you, agricultural. <laughs> don't, don't You don't move here unless you want to be in the agricultural right. area. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's the same, like I said, going back to the, the property maintenance thing, there were some things that were worded very specifically in that, that we have different from the, the core IPMC, because we wanted to make sure that we had a tool that could help people but not beat them over the head with it unnecessarily. Right. So I think uh, I think we're in the right the right channel for this. I think the noise ordinance is a great idea. I think we just need to be very very specific. So uh, as you had put, Irene, that it withstands the test of time, is legally enforceable if we need to legally enforce it, and it does exactly what we're intending it to do without any adverse consequences. Absolutely, and and I'm hoping that it serves as a deterrent. Yeah, more so than anything else. Absolutely. That's kind of, that was kind of the hope with the IPMC, too, is if people know that, hey, this is the thing that I need to be aware of as a, a home or property owner, it would just kind of organically happen on its own without any sort of enforcement. Which is not to, to steal from G.I. Joe, but knowing is half the battle. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So if we don't have any other points on that, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the Marion Fire Company waiver request. Uh, they had requested that we waive building permit fees for some additions and improvements that we'd be making on the, the fire hall, not the, excuse me, not the fire hall, the, uh, the engine house on 422. Uh, we would need a motion to either grant or deny such a request. However, we had kind of put back to them that we're not the, the sole recipient of those fees. There are aspects of that that are out of pocket costs to craft codes, which is where the fees go. Um, personally, I'm not inherently opposed to waiving the townships component of it, but I, I would not want to waive craft codes component of it. If craft wants to donate their time, there's a very specific way that they wouldn't do that uh, in terms of waiving the fee, if you would. Um, but we shouldn't go any further until craft was contacted by the fire company and has either given a yes or no on their aspect of it. And I know, Irene, you had had some concerns about setting a precedence for, for yeah. waiving fees and things like that. Um, yeah. And for the most part, I'm inclined to agree with you. There are always extenuating circumstances, but um, we have such a close relationship with the fire company or should have such a close relationship with the fire company uh, with them being on our insurance and a, a number of other aspects that we have very close interconnections with them on that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not super concerned about setting a precedence on this mm -hmm. particular one because of it being so atypical to if a, a homeowner comes mm -hmm. or another business comes to us and asks for the same thing. Mm -hmm. I guess Ed, maybe we've had a little bit of a change of heart on that issue. Daryl had stopped in the office and he may mention that um, in the past, Marion Township had made contributions to the fire departments. So I guess this would be considered a charitable contribution towards them if yeah. they were to proceed, but they need to get on the ball and they need to write or the contact craft code. Absolutely. Okay. Speaking of waiver requests, the next item on the agenda is Landmark Homes is actually asking for a uh, waiver request. Uh, they're requesting the waiver of building permit fees for 299 Sweet Birch Lane. Uh, this is actually because the house uh, never got built. So they're looking to see if they can get a refund on some of the, the costs that were not actually uh, incurred around that. Um, and uh, we're asking craft codes to find out if this was a spec home or if this was uh, something that a, a buyer had purchased and then backed out of. Um, my standpoint is if we can get an itemized breakdown from Kraft or from McCarthy or whoever else had a, a hand in those fees, what was actually used and what wasn't. If it was not used, I think they're well within their rights to ask for it back. Yeah, I mean, if, again, the issue would be Kraft would incur or McCarthy would incur a different fee, but for us, it's, it's just issuing that permit fee. Yeah, so so Irene, specifically what I'm saying is if we go to Kraft and Kraft says out of the, let's say, $100, we used 20 and McCarthy says, yeah, we used $22, um, then there's $60 that they have paid in that we, in my mind, we should give them back if they're saying we're not actually yeah. moving forward with yeah. this project. That, okay, yes, you actually, yeah. you incurred costs, but whatever you didn't, refunding yeah i have no problem with that but okay. if they had the permit approved you're talking a permit prices about three thousand dollars yeah so what i'm saying is out of that three thousand dollars if if they've actually used three thousand dollars then obviously we say like there's nothing to refund you you paid in three grand and between Kraft and mccarthy and everything else these are the costs that went into it there's nothing to return however if we if we get contact from Kraft and McCarthy and they say, yeah, we only used a small per percentage of this. The, the rest was for inspections that have never happened because the home was never built. It's essentially a prepayment in my mind. So it would be like if you overpaid your electric bill and then the next month they send you a check saying, hey, you actually, you sent mm -hmm. in too much money. That's that's my personal stance on it. Um, Irene, Jim, we need to decide this as a board though. So what are your Thoughts. No, I don't have a problem. If the funds were already used uh, for preparation, et cetera, et cetera, I, 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 I'm fine with refunding the portion that wasn't used. Well, I think in the past we did have a waiver request granted on a garage that never got built because the person yeah. died. Um, and I think Kraft figured out for us what their actual cost was to approve the permit. Um, you know, and then um, the, the inspection fees kind of got waived. Yeah. 
I think that's, um, yeah. that's... I, know, I, I think if I remember correctly, he was, so he, so the, the boyfriend got the permit and the homeowner died. Um, and then he was asked to pay a portion that was already, the costs that were incurred to the township. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but, but not the inspection fees because that didn't happen yet. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think that's roughly the exact same thing we should do in this situation okay. is find out what was actually spent. And then if there's a, there's a surplus, we give it back to them. Dan, okay. you, you have something you want to weigh in on? Yeah. When was this home supposed to be built? When? Don't know. I'll be honest, don't know. off the top of my head, no idea. I'd have to look. When yeah. the permit was issued. Well, you could have a situation where the permit would be issued, but it wouldn't get built for maybe another year. calendar year. Well, that's or, why or I, I specifically asked was this a spec home or did the buyer back out? Because um, you know, if it's just a landmark saying they decided not to build the house, that's one thing. But if it's mm -hmm. a buyer who, you know, went through with signing all the paperwork, um, had the permit approved, the permit was actually approved back in October of 2020. You know, but if it's a buyer who backed out, then that's kind of a different situation, sort of kind of. I mean, regardless, it's if they, whether it's landmark or the homeowner, if they've paid in money that isn't actually going to be used. I, I'm yeah. still kind of of the mindset that we should we should give give back what's due. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So I we had the too. same issue with the solar loan, or the solar panel permit last year. Also, if you recall that. Um, well, yeah, that was the case where he, the guy, went through the the solar company actually went, uh, you know, did the permit. The permit was approved, and then the guy said, "Oh no, I'm going to go with a different company. I don't want your company anymore." Um, yeah. Was that was that granted? Was that waiver granted? I don't remember. Yeah. Okay, we, we did that too. Yeah, okay. I mean this yeah, permit I, here, uh, the total yeah. cost is two thousand seven hundred sixty-eight dollars and thirty-five cents. Right. Unless um, unless we have something in our permit fees that say it's non-refundable, then I think we're obligated to refund it. So I can anyway. look in the. Um, yeah. There's an instruction sheet that Kraft attaches. I can look in there. Yeah. And it's just looking at that information because if it says certain part portion of it is non-refundable, then it's non-refundable. But if it doesn't say that, and I think I want to say I think we had this issue not that long ago, because it, it seems vaguely familiar. And I could tell you, I'm pretty sure that I did some deposits for the 299 uh, Sweet Birch uh, recently within the past month or two because that that uh, looks familiar. Boy, the guys are coming through my neighborhood quite a bit today. Yeah, I made some calls this morning, Irene. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's let's put a pin in that for right now then, and let's wait to hear back from them. Not that that really necessarily changes the scenario, whether it was buyer back out or landmark back out, and we'll look and see if there's any any wording in there about refundability or percentage of refundability, and we'll go from there. Yep, because it's a contract, and, and people have to stick to the contract. Yep. Okay. Next up on the agenda is the Bethel, Marion, Tulpahawken open space plan. Uh, we have received a letter indicating that the final payment and all documentation has been received. So that is now complete and uh, it's fully usable for any grant requests that we or the community association, association may have uh, where they can benefit from having that joint open space plan. And uh, once, I think we have a copy of that. I have a copy that I downloaded that should be actually out on I think that's out on the Google Drive in the public area if anybody would like to look at it. Um, and I will put the public area link, as I usually do, into the chat here if anybody would like it. I'm trying to remember where I put that exactly. I don't think it's in the meeting minutes. And they dropped off some booklets and discs for us at the office. Yeah, if it's not there, I know I downloaded a copy of it. I will put it out in the main public directory. I might have put it in. Because you have the disc. Yeah, I, I know I saved a copy from the mm -hmm. disc. I'm just trying to remember where I put it. Um, I'll find it and I'll, I'll bring sometimes it up on Thursday night. Sometimes we call it Bethel, Mary, and Tupac, and sometimes we just call it Open Space Plan. Or Greenway uh, plan yep. or... I see it. I see where it is. Okay, so I'm going to move it right into the main 
the main public directory. It's actually named Comprehensive Recreation Parks Open Space and Greenways Plan is what they is what they yeah. named it, which is why I wasn't finding it right away. <laughs> um, so I've moved that to the main section and I'll, I'll make a folder for other similar plans and studies. Like I know we had that heat study a few years back. I'll put that out there as well. And uh, that way everybody has it. You can look at it and you don't even need to put in a right to know. Okay. Next up, uh, we actually have a situation where there are two individuals, um, three individuals, technically speaking, who are interested in working on the road crew. Uh, the first is Travis Oberholzer. Well, you, you had appointed Travis, I believe, the December meeting, but then I missed him the on the reorg meeting. Yeah. So technically, he needs to be appointed, appointed. for this year. Mm -hmm. Yep. So Travis Oberholzer, uh, Dave Patrick, and Josh Bellman. Um, Josh is a new resident in town, and uh, th is Dave Patrick also a new resident in town? No, no, no. He lives out near Dutch Valley okay. Food Distributors, um, and he said he's a truck driver, and um, when it snows, he doesn't go out on the road, so he's available. Okay, that, that's phenomenal then. Um, so I, I'll make a motion to appoint the following individuals to the road crew. Travis Oberholzer, Dave Patrick, and Josh Bellman. Second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. I'll let them know. Okay, thank you. And then I'll try to get something set up maybe once the, the snow neatens a little bit but uh, or clears a little bit, get all the road crew together. So obviously observing social distancing and masks and stuff like that, but have everybody kind of as a, a touch point for being on the same page for plowing, salting, mm -hmm. cindering, when we need to go out. Um, for the most part, um, I'm always happy to take a phone call, but what I've told Butch and Kevin and everybody else is if you see a problem and it's not going to be like something that you have to spend a bunch of money on, if it's a simple matter of, I know it's snowing, go out. You don't have to wait for my permission to do it go clear the roads, go open up the roads, go clear a, a, a sheet of ice or throw down salt if you know the weather is going to be bad. You can always text me, you can always call me, but I want them to be empowered to make that decision because they've been doing this for a very long time and they, they kind of know when and how things need to be done in that respect. Okay. Next up on the agenda is the riding mower repairs. Uh, we had a, a situation where the engine was uh, leaking oil out of one of the seals. Uh, we will need to have that completely fixed and uh, do an oil change and a lube and everything like that in advance of the, the upcoming spring season. Otherwise, we won't be able to use that mower for cutting grass. So are you, uh, are we, or I should say, are we as a board okay with uh, sending that off to one of the repair places, whether that's Binkley and Hearst or Eblings or wherever to, to be serviced. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll send it, we'll send it in, but we should motion around that just so that it's nice and official. So I'll make a motion to uh, make the, the necessary repairs on the riding mower, including, but not limited to uh, seals on the engine, oil change and lube. Second. Roll call, Peter. Aye. Irene. Aye. Jim. Aye. Okay, next up on the agenda is the Berks County Household Hazardous Waste. This will be held at Governor Mifflin Intermediate School on Saturday, April 17th, 2021. Pre-registration is required. Uh, so if you are interested in that, we'll make sure that... Uh, full information is available around that. Uh, Thursday night, I'll have the, the contact information, whether it's phone or email or anything like that. And I will share it on the screen during the meeting. And we will also post it at the, the township building. That is, that is on the Berks County website. Okay. Also good that it's on the Berks County website. Yeah, but, if you uh, go we'll... under, um, if you click on departments and go under solid waste authority, it's on that page. Okay. Okay, next item on the agenda then is the Pennsylvania Compensation Rating Bureau. Uh, they're conducting a study of code 994, which is the volunteer fire company portion. Uh, 
they want a brief questionnaire completed on their website. Uh, so this is going to be a situation where somebody from the township, whether it's myself or like, for example, John, as the EMC, if you would like to take part in this, we're going to need to sit down with the fire department uh, more than likely on one of our laptops, because I don't think there's a high, high rate of laptop use amongst most of the members of the fire department uh, and go through that, that form and help them fill that out. Sure, John would love to help you. With yeah, that. I, I mean, I'd like, I'd love to be involved too, but I think this might be a good opportunity for bridge building between us as a board, John as an EMC, and the fire company. Yeah, if you could facilitate the meeting, I think that would be wisest, and okay. uh, I'm sure they would prefer you to be present with John. Okay, absolutely. I'll make that uh, make that a thing that happens in the near future. Let me know. I'd like to attend as well, Peter. Okay, I'll, I'll make sure. I'd love to attend too. Okay, I'll put a line out and see what we can get set up. Okay, last item on the agenda is the Act 537. I sent the memo over to the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, we have not heard back from them yet, but... Uh, that's not necessarily cause for alarm. There's usually some delay in response on things. Um, in addition, Alan Madera would like to meet with us and provide his input about the, uh, the pump out letter packet that we're sending out. Um, I'm gonna be trying to set something up with him. Should be a relatively brief conversation. I'd like to do it over Zoom so that we can all kind of see each other, ideally hear each other, and we can share out the document on on a screen and look at it together in real time and potentially affect changes. If he says like, I'd really like to, to have this wording adjusted or you really should add this or uh, you shouldn't really say this this way because it's going to be confusing for people. Um, that way we can we can use it as kind of a uh, a working session to, to finalize what he's going to need in that letter to ensure people are able to comply with the ordinance. So I'll, I'll slip that in this upcoming week in addition to the, the CMS stuff with Lisa. Okay, that concludes all the agenda items. Um, we'll move into the supervisor's comments section. Uh, I have a, a series of comments. Uh, the first one is we received an email from the Berks County Public Works Association uh, complimenting our road crew for their excellent job of snow removal during the, the major portion of the snowfall that we had. They kept a lot of the major roads open and passable. I know we had some complaints and concerns around some of the, the, the feeder roads, but for the most part, the main roads were kept open and, and running during the, the worst of it. Um, it's worth noting that the big truck in, in the midst of all of this actually broke down and was in the shop. So they were forced to work and do things kind of on double time with just the small truck and some of the other pieces of equipment that we had, like the John Deere tractor and the grader. So they did a, a, an excellent job and really put in the extra effort there to make sure that a lot of the roads kept passable during that time. Um, we do obviously have some, some lessons learned from that. And there's some things that I'm, I'm going to be talking to the guys about, maybe ways to improve going forward. But overall, the the, the job they did during during that snow emergency was was exemplary. Uh, I'd also like to thank the farmers who helped out with the snow removal during that time, uh, especially Daryl Brubaker, who did not actually charge the township for any of his time or use of his equipment when that when that happened. He did that entirely out of the the, the generosity and goodness of his own heart. So special thank you to Daryl. I think we should maybe consider sending him a, a, a little card or something as a thank you note. We don't have to send like a gift card or anything like that, but a simple note saying, thank you. We appreciate everything that you did. And it really does make a difference in the community. Um, DCED as a kind of a topic shift is now accepting uh, grant applications for Act 13. One of the things that you can get funded under Act 13 is Act 537 planning costs. Um, I'm wondering if we can apply for that grant and use it towards some of the revisions that we're looking to make to the plan, as well as the income study. That would make that, that whole process even easier to approach if we have grant funding to do it. Let me know what I can do to help you. Okay, so I, 
if, if you want to get a head start on me, I'm going to read through some of the, the Act 13 requirements around grants and see what we can and can't do and what we have to do to submit for it. Um, but we're, we're technically doing planning for an Act, Act 537 revision. And one of the things that we want to incorporate into our planning is income study data. I think we can very easily, unless there's something outright prohibiting it, make that compelling argument that this would be a good use of the grant, the grant money. Well, let me ask you a question on that. Do we have to wait for the DEP to say, yes, you can make a revision before we proceed with a, with a grant? Formal rewrite, like actually submitting it to them? Probably. They have already told Jim McCarthy that they are willing to review any revisions that we would like to put forward. Uh, in, a, in a capacity that they've not done for many, many, many years, which is a kind of a preliminary review. What has been happening over recent history is you draft a plan and you send it to them. And that's, that's the first review you get. Um, what we could use this for would be getting some of the stuff together, doing a preliminary write-up and sending it to them, and, and then having conversation kind of outside of the formal channel of formal submission review and then them either accepting it or rejecting it that we can work constructively with them for here's what we're thinking and they may come back it's very much a negotiation i think at, at this point where we'd send some stuff in they'd send some stuff back we maybe have some meetings where we say like we're thinking this they're thinking that and hopefully we'll be able to find some mutually beneficial uh, conclusions for what we need in Marion and what they have to conform to from a regulatory standpoint. Mm -hmm. So if you can start looking through Act 13, I'm going to do likewise throughout the week. And if there's a, an opportunity for us for what we're going to be doing anyway to get some, some assistance to offset any of the costs that we may have around it, I think that's a no-brainer. Uh, the only other thing that I have is one last reminder. Uh, don't forget to fill out your SEC, the ethics forms, and get them back to Sue. They are due no later than April the 15th. That I still owe you mine, Sue. I got to finish filling it out and bring it in, but uh, April 15th will be here before we all realize it. So. Well, they're actually, they're actually due to me May 1st, but I put on the letter April 15th because I usually get them the day after May 1st. So. Okay. Um, but have no fears. I will hound you. <laughs> okay. Okay. No worries. I will, I will let you continue to chase me, but I saw that on the thing and I was just like, man, I should probably remind them because I know I've been kind of lax with doing that too. Um, okay. I know Irene's, uh, oh, she's back. Okay. Irene, do you have, <laughs> it's okay. Do you have any comments that you'd like to make? No, I mean, I think everything was mentioned before. Um, you know, again, thanks to Aikens. Uh, they're, they're helping us too, which, was completely unexpected um but certainly welcome um and uh, i'll be going to fulton bank I, I think i know last meeting i discussed it with pliggett i think the requirements for pliggett are just too high for us as far as what we what funds we have available and and what our typical financial picture looks like we're, we're just not a large uh, revenue kind of uh, township. So, I mean, I'm gonna get back with all the information from Fulton Bank, again, compare it to Pliggett and uh, um, get back to everyone over what some of our options are as far as uh, long range planning and credit card usage and ACH payments. So i um, kind of looking forward to that information again. Thanks to Dan and Sue, um, getting things really in order uh, financially so that we're kind of in that autopilot mode and we don't have to, we don't have to worry about things as much and then maintaining that and teaching it to people down the road so that we continue to be a healthy township in that respect. So good. I'm writing myself notes here too. <laughs> good, 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 good. Okay, Jim, do you have any comments? I had a nice uh, Zoom meeting with Seltzer Group uh, about our property and casualty and workers' compensation insurance. We uh, reviewed it. Um, it's a unique thing because most brokers don't offer municipal insurance options, so they're one of the few that does. So, you know, we would be locked in pretty much to whatever they would charge us, but the rates are pretty pretty good. Uh, I did have a comparison done with a, one of my brokers that I work with that does property and casualty, he looked at it and said that he wouldn't have been able to beat it anyway. So he was very impressed. The only couple of things that they brought to my attention was we do have a couple of pieces of equipment on the insurance policy that, for example, we have the lawnmower uh, 
one of the lawnmowers um, valued at $600, but we have a $500 deductible. So would we ever put that in? Because they would you know, prorate that based on how old it is. It probably yeah. isn't worth $500. Yeah, so it isn't a significant savings, but they suggested that we may want to remove a couple of items of the smaller items and save. It may only be a, less than a $10 savings, but like I, they said, $10 is $10. So yeah, exactly. Look at that. Yeah, so if you, if you would be able to put kind of a, a short list of the suggestions in an email, we'll we'll do that on Thursday night. We'll talk about that oh. and then maybe make some some authorizations to change some of the insurance around. But they're doing a great job for us. That really, what I what I was able to ascertain from talking to other brokers is they've kept our rates low. Uh, they're providing a good service for us, and would be happier with the participation from them on the Zoom meeting the other day. They were very knowledgeable. I know any, any of the times that I've had to deal with them about like the, the events for the community association, they've always been uh, a pleasure to work with. Yes. Agree. Okay. Just a quick question on that. Sue, you were able to get, were you able to get the declarations page from Zinn? I did. And I emailed that to everybody. I don't have that in my folder today, but yeah, That's I did okay. get it. I and remember there, there I do actually email. remember that. Yeah, there was an email, I want to say, like two weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. Jim, were you able to take a look at that stuff? Yeah, they're same situation. There's very few companies that are able to provide coverage. Um, and it looked like it was in line. You know, I don't think we would find anybody that's going to do it for any less. In fact, pretty much what you're going to find is that anyone who is in that business, the rates are pretty much locked by, you know, everyone's going to have the, pretty much the same rate. So if you're getting good service, I don't know how, how much service the fire department gets from them, but if they're happy with it, I would say leave it for that. I know I've worked with Zinn in the past and they're nice people. Thank you very much for your expertise and, and doing that work. Yeah. Thank you very much. No problem. Jim. No problem. Okay. Sue, do you have any comments? I um, just wanted to say that I got several compliments from residents about the good job that our road crew did during the snowstorm at the end of January. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Okay, very good. Considering our we had equipment down, um, I think they did a pretty good job. <laughs> yeah, we actually, uh, just rolling back, we had the problem with the big truck, and then we actually had a, a smaller, more minor problem that took the little truck out of commission mm -hmm. for a day or two as well. So there, there was a lot of... of juggling trying to make things work in terms of oh man we have half as many things to, to do plowing now and they still manage to keep things mm -hmm. open and to mm -hmm. a degree that that was noticeably good for a lot of people right. so okay we don't have any other items on the agenda i will make a motion to adjourn the meeting the time is now 10 42 a.m second we'll call peter hi irene hi jim Aye. Okay. Okay. Motion adjourned. Thank you, everyone, and stay safe, stay warm. And if we don't talk sooner than Thursday, I'll see everyone on Thursday night's Board of Supervisors meeting. Okay. Have a great Thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.